So last time um, we finally finished off by deriving a solution to the classical wave equation um, and the solution looked something like this. So we were left off um, with the idea that the solution is a linear superposition of normal modes. Um, and I told you that a normal mode was basically each u of xt term. So now we're going to start talking a little bit about what these normal modes are. Um, it's, it's really not important to understand modes, um, normal modes and linear superposition states from the classical wave. The classical wave is useful to kind of um, understand the math behind the phenomena of separation of variables. So the classical wave equation is a really good problem that helps us um, kind of set up our understanding of how to use separation of variables. Um, but beyond that, the classical wave equation um, won't be much use to us. We'll be moving on now to the Schrodinger wave equation soon enough. But before we do that, I want to simply um, explain a little bit about what each un x of t represents. So it turns out that each un x of t represents something called a normal mode of vibration. Basically, each u n x of t term represents a different standing wave. So these are the different types of standing waves you can have because of each u n x of t term. So when you have u1, basically when n is equal to 1, um, that was the example we set off with, a string that was tied on two ends and it went up and down, up and down, up and down, like this guy. So the formula, so if I put n is equal to 1 and I graph that formula, this big formula over here with n is equal to 1, then I would get this image. Similarly, when n is equal to 2, um, I get this sort of wave being formed. When n is equal to 3, the wave gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When n is equal to 4, the wave continues its pattern of getting bigger and bigger. So the few things I want to point out here is that you need to notice that the ends are tied of each string. So these ends are basically the boundaries of each string. So that's it. These are the boundaries, that they don't have any other name than simply calling them boundaries. But what's important is something called nodes or nodal points. So nodes or nodal points are basically, um, they're points that don't really move um, in, in these waves. They're, so because of the presence of these nodal points or these nodes, I call these waves standing waves because they're standing at the nodes. Everywhere else they're going up and down, up and down, up and down, but at the nodes these are simply standing. They don't have any net movement. So the important question is what pattern do you see in reference to nodes? When n is equal to 1, I don't have any nodes. I just have two boundaries, but that's not a node. That's just where I tie the string down. So when n is equal to 1, I have zero nodes. When n is equal to 2, I have one node somewhere over here. So I have one node. When n is equal to 2, or I mean 3, then I have one node somewhere over here, and then I have another node somewhere over here. So the number of nodes is two nodes. So I can't really pinpoint the nodes exactly. I guess I'm not that dexterous, um, but uh, roughly they're somewhere there. Um, when n is equal to 4, then the nodes are here, here, and here somewhere around there. So three nodes. So the point is, is that the number of nodes is simply n minus 1. And these are the waves that come out from the classical wave equation. Um, you don't have to, you know, you don't, if you, if you find this to be extremely hard and you're getting confused, it's okay. Um, this isn't really going to be, you know, the foundations of 
quantum mechanics that if you don't understand this you're doomed for quantum mechanics that's not the case this is just an example that we start off with to kind of make you comfortable with the math associated with quantum mechanics specifically the math associated with the phenomena of separation of variables um, and it's also kind of neat to show you what the formulas give rise to in terms of physical systems what do these formulas model well these models these formulas they model they give mathematical descriptions of moving waves in our case standing waves at nodal points um, so this is a standing wave because of the presence of non-changing nodes so the nodes are at one fixed point so what's the quantum chemistry connection? What's the quantum physics connection? Well, the idea here is, is that electrons are simply standing waves around an atom. If you look at these waves, um, you notice that, well, basically, certain amount of wavelengths fit into each of these waves. Here, I have half of a wavelength because one wave looks like this guy, right? So I have one full wavelength here and I have half a wavelength here. So here I have one wavelength. Here I have one and a half wavelength and here I have two wavelengths. Similarly like this, atoms essentially have electrons that are standing waves around them. Um, and the key point is that you can only have a fixed number of waves um, an integer number of waves around atoms. So if I have an atom, the first shell may be a wave kind of like this. So it has to be a full wave. This doesn't look like a full wave, but it has to be um, a full integer number of waves, n pi. So that's where something called quantization comes from. So the more um, n levels you have, the more waves you can fit in. Okay, so essentially the point is the more waves you have, the more energy you have. So electrons that are further away from the nucleus have more energies because um, they constitute bigger waves. Um, so that's one connection. The another connection is that covalent bonds or bonds that are formed from interference of these waves, that's also the result of basically two electrons um, from different orbitals or same orbitals kind of um, connecting with each other. So the interference between two electrons give rise to bonds. So electrons are waves. We will learn this soon enough, but it's more important to understand that we will be dealing with electrons as standing waves. So if two electron waves add up, then we get something called a bond, okay? If the two electron waves are in the same phase, so same phase is the key word, so if these are in the same phase, then you get a bond. However, if these electrons are in different phases, okay, um, then what happens is you get a destructive effect and you get something called an antibond. So these antibonds are extremely unstable um, and they don't really give rise to stable elements. So this is the quantum chemical um, connection. Hopefully this helps and in the next video series we'll start off with, or sorry, in the next um, few videos we'll discuss probability and statistics. So once we get the math figured out that that's involved with probability and statistics, we'll move on to the general principles and the postulates of quantum mechanics.